Frack is a Paralympic athlete. Since Ezra was four years old, he has spoken at schools, bringing his message that being different is okay and raising awareness and understanding for the physically challenged. Ezra was born with congenital limb differences, missing his left knee and left fibula and fingers on his left hand. At 11 months, when he started to pull himself up to stand, he received his first prosthetic leg. He quickly learned to walk and has been unstoppable ever since. Since Ezra could crawl, Ezra has always loved sports. Ezra's passion for competing in sports was the motivation behind the organization Angel City Games, a multi-sport competition for physically disabled children, adults, wounded warriors, and elite athletes. Ezra also enjoys mentoring and inspiring younger amputees to be active and live their life to the fullest. You were born with congenital limb differences. Can you tell us a little bit about you know, your differences that you were born with? Yeah, I was, uh, I was born with one finger on my left hand and I had a lower left leg that was almost curved in towards my waist. And at two and a half years old, I had a surgery in Boston and the doctors removed the curved part of my left leg. And then they took the big toe that was on the former left foot and put it onto my left hand. So this, is, uh, this used to be a former toe that was on my left leg. So I was able to, you know, with one finger, you can't really hold much, but then you add a second finger and you can pick things up. You can hold things. I can hold my phone. I can hold all sorts of things now. Like so, since I got the left, uh, since I got the, the toe from the left leg and then I got a stump, which could fit into a prosthetic leg much easier than a leg that was curved in like this. So that definitely made it easier to walk, play sports and whatnot. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about the, the whole background of my medical history, I guess, when I was younger. And so um, did your parents know uh, when you were, or obviously, you know, during pregnant, your, you know, pregnant, your mom's pregnancy and so yeah. forth, that you were going to be um, born with these congenital limb differences? Um, or was it, you know, obviously it came out, you know, when you were born? They did not know, actually. They, uh, right. what's the thing, ultrasound, where they, they look to make sure the baby's healthy? They only check my right side which happens to be the completely able-bodied side. Right, and okay. So then, um, and so now that same place that, that did the ultrasound now checks both sides because, of, uh, because I was a bit of a surprise when I was born. What type of prosthetic do you use? And uh, what was the process like of getting fitted for uh, this prosthetic? Yeah, right now I use, a, I use a suction prosthetic with just like a simple hinge knee. Um, for my walking leg. And then I also have another leg that I use for track and field. It's like a, it's a blade, um, has a different knee, different, different setup completely. It's super light, super quick and fast. But um, the process for getting fit for a prosthetic, we usually do like a, a mold to make sure that the socket fits around my leg. And so there's many different ways to do it. There's like the fancy way with like all the technology. And then like the old fashioned ways, they just take plaster and they just plaster it around my leg. And then they have a mold for what they can then make the socket with. Um, so I haven't been fitted with the prosthetic leg in a while. I've, I've, we're actually planning on doing one pretty soon. But yeah, once we get the socket, um, we just throw the knee and the foot on there and then make it work, I guess. Yeah. And have you gotten, I mean, you have a number of prosthetics and uh, do you, like how often do you have to um, get a, a new prosthetic um, or are they pretty much, you know, permanent, I mean, not permanent, but, you know, long lasting forever, quote unquote. Yeah, I'm sure once I stop growing, they'll become more long lasting or permanent in a sense, because you're not having to constantly adjust the height. Um, but because I'm still growing, I'm still getting stronger, we're constantly adjusting the height. And, you know, this knee's breaking, because I'm pounding too hard. And this, you know, this isn't working, we're constantly, you know, adjusting things and figuring things out. So I would say, um, definitely not as long lasting as if I was like completely stopped growing. Cause we're constantly like raising the leg up a little bit to mm -hmm. match the hips. Um, but, uh, but yeah, once I, once I get older, they'll become more long lasting. I hope maybe cause I'll probably calm down and not be running and doing all this crazy stuff all the time that causes them to break. 
Right. Do you want to um, become a professional athlete post college and so forth? Yeah. I mean, is that, is that what you want to do career wise? That is what I want to do career wise. I mean, I, I wouldn't say career wise because at some point, like, track's going to end and I got to do other things with my life. <laughs> um, but for right now, that's the goal. The goal is to yeah, ride sure. it out as long as I ride it out till the till my right leg stops working. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, sports is great. Like, obviously, as they told you know, you and your dad, I mean, I love sports and um, yeah, I think it's really important. Um, especially if it makes you feel like really good on the field um, or like when you're playing. Uh, so as an athlete um, and when you started um, playing sports, were there any um, other athletes that inspired you? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, when I was younger, I was a really big basketball fan. Like I love bas- basketball is my number one sport. I hadn't even started track until I was eight. So by the time those first eight years was basketball, basketball, basketball. Um, and a player that I looked up to was Pau Gasol, and he's actually, a, he became a family friend of ours, and we were in contact with him, but I would say he was pretty much an inspiration for me when I was younger, because um, uh, he, he was the sweetest guy ever, he worked really hard, and so I guess in, in that sense, when I was younger, he inspired me a lot, and then, uh, and then as I got older, of course, I, I had, you know, different people who inspired me and whatnot, and my parents inspired me, but as far as, like, an athlete goes, I think as a, at a younger age, it was Pau, for sure. Okay. And uh, how did he uh, influence you like with your daily challenges and being on the court, if any? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, it was super cool to see someone that I idolized so much mm-hmm. sort of take interest in me and hang out with me and spend time with me and show me that he cared about what I was doing and to not let my disability hold me back, basically, mm-hmm. in a sense. And he also, up until when I really met him, I didn't use my left hand for very many things throughout the day. I just... Mm-hmm. My right hand and we're like you know if I'm playing basketball I would go to my right side and he would when we would hang out he would force me to dribble with the left hand and practice dribbling with my two fingers and getting my left side stronger which now is something that's so crucial in a part of my daily life is like I don't even think about it. I use both hands equally because of that what he sort of instilled at me in me when I was younger right and it's you know I think it's always important um, which obviously different enable um, is all about, but to um, have people um, where you can a get support, you know, get support from, but b you can look up to, um, because yeah. clearly, as you and you know your parents and family know, you know when you have some type of difference, congenital to, you know, CP, and you know you cover the gamut, um, finding support and you know mentors can be difficult. Uh, and so, um, it's great that you found, uh, somebody that really yeah. inspired you. Um, I think yeah. that's great. Um, and now you inspire others. Definitely. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. For sure. So in 2014, you were a finalist, um, for sports illustrated, um, of the special, the special sports kid, um, or sports kid. Yeah. And, uh, obviously that was very quote unquote, like celebrity ish. Um, so have you, and I know you've done a lot of speaking engagements in schools and, um, if I'm not mistaken, you also have been in, uh, you've gone on, Oh, uh, not Oprah, the Ellen show. Uh, so, um, have you grown accustomed to this quote unquote celebrity status? I wouldn't call it a celebrity status. Um, I just like, I mean, I've done some cool stuff. I've been a part of some really cool things. I've been able to be on cool shows and be a finalist for a sports kid of the year. I would not, I wouldn't consider myself a a celebrity though, maybe within like my family compared to, and like, like in my little community, but um, not yet. Maybe one day, one day we'll, uh, we'll have this conversation again and it'll be a little bit different, but for right now, I'm just, I'm just a 15 year old kid who runs track and speaks about, you know, people with physical disabilities and stuff like that. And so that's, I wouldn't consider myself like a celebrity yet, but. Do you think your uh, self-esteem or self, self-esteem, self self-assurance um, has affected um, either of your um, brothers, your self-assurance to um, experience like freedom from self-doubt um, and negativity? I, I truly hope it has. I mean, for my brothers, my brothers are, you know, such a big aspect of my life and so if I can 
you know, have done anything that's influenced them and the way they think about themselves and the confidence they have to be themselves and not worry about what other people think. Um, mm -hmm. So if I've done that in any way, which I hope I have, um, it would definitely mean a lot to me. I mean, they're, they're my favorite people in the world. So anything that I can do to make their lives a little bit better in that sense, it's, I, I'm all for it. And I hope that I did that. So, yeah. And I'm sure that they look up to you like there's no tomorrow. So you influence a lot of people and you, you know, give a lot of messages of hope at different um, events, schools, you know, conferences and so forth. Um, one of your messages that you proclaim is being different is okay. What sparked you to get to that message um, and how have you seen it affect in a positive light um, other people with uh, disabilities or differences? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think as far as like quotes go, it's a somewhat basic quote, just not super like it doesn't not a lot of like wordplay and all that sort of, but I genuinely think the message that it carries um, is really strong. Like it's being different is okay. And we're all different, right? Whether we look different, whether we think different, whether we act different, we all have differences. We all have challenges in our own way and hurdles and obstacles to overcome. Um, and so when I was younger, I, I, I always, I didn't really feel like I fit in and I always felt like an outsider, you know, with the people I was around. But then I, as I got older, you just embrace that. I'm embracing the fact that I'm different from my friends. I'm embracing the fact that I'm the only kid in my school with one leg, you know, that I'm able to do all this stuff. And so the quote being different is okay. Just stems that like being diff, like everyone's different. And, and there's the one thing in the world that makes us the same is the fact that we're all different. And so to be able to share that message with, you know, people, even able-bodied people who may, you know, look different or feel, feel insecure about something, just know that like being different is okay. If I'm not here with one leg saying that, you know, then someone in a wheelchair can feel confident within themselves. And someone who, you know, maybe thinks they're not quote unquote pretty can, you know, feel confident within themselves. So hopefully that like small sort of not necessarily like um, big wordplay quote. It's just sort of a simple quote that I said that's just truly from the heart can uh, inspire some sort of positive and confidence change within people. I think it's, I think it's a great quote. And, and, you know, as I mentioned before, it was that video um, <laughs> when you were younger um, that really, you know, sparked my, um, you know, that's it. it it, it affected me in terms of, you know, in a positive light um, and really kind of motivated me that, you know, other people like specifically you, um, you know, they use the word different. I think also the word different um, has a more positive um, connotation um, than the word quote unquote having a disability or, you know, so forth. Yeah, That's I why think, yeah, I think different almost like because the just word disability sort of puts sometimes puts people um, you know, separates people with physical disabilities in a certain category, while as like different is just like, that's everyone, everyone's different. Like I'm different from, you know, my friend, my friend's different, you know, from my mom, like everybody's different in their own way. It mm -hmm. doesn't like necessarily like put a, put people with physical disabilities in a, necessarily a category. It's just, everyone's different. Like that's just how it is. And so, I mean, I, I, of course, like the word disabilities is not something that like uh, that some people might take offense to one on I don't personally just because it's such like it's so difficult for people to even understand what a physical disability is and understand it and try to uh, but I do think that different is just like another cool word to describe it's like I'm different you're different like that's just how it is right exactly um and yeah I think that's what makes you um just so special and so unique um about I yourself um, it's no, it's, I, I commend you and, um, I really celebrate that, um, you know, you know, within you and so forth. So a lot of different athletes have, uh, different, um, unique rituals that they do at, you know, certain games, um, or, you know, something pre and post, you know, uh, a game like so for um lebron uh james he does um a powder toss at the beginning yeah. of each game are there any uh uh unique rituals that you do unique rituals um or just I, a ritual in general I, have to be I think a ritual a ritual that i do before every track competition is i uh i meditate before mm -hmm. I, meditation recently has become a big part of my life um, and making sure that I'm in the correct headspace and clear mind and good thoughts and, you know, beautiful state. 
Um, so I meditate before any track competition and that definitely plays a big role in my performance. Um, well, I do, this is kind of like a cool ritual, like a thing that I do. I, uh, I do this stretch on the high jump mat where I lean off the end of it and it stretches my back and it has, you have your, I'm laying upside down. Um, and when I do that, it's almost just, and then when I sit up, it's almost just like, it's like, all right, we're ready to go. And so doing that sort of stretch and feeling the blood rush to your face and then, you know, getting back up, it's like a bit of like an awakening sort of thing that I've, that I do just to stretch out my back originally, but then sort of became like a quote unquote ritual, I guess, for me. Right. And, uh, obviously there's the stretching, but what specifically about meditation, um, helps you, um, during a, a game and or before a game, just in terms of like calming your nerves. I mean, before, take- yeah, before any track competition, I, um, it, the meditation is all, I, I go to this, this place. Cause I mean, there's thousands of people in the stands chanting and like, so all this stuff going on, there's so much stuff constantly going through on my head. And for that, you know, however long the competition is, or the, the race is, I need to be completely calm, level-headed, collected, um, and not be worried about whatever's going on. I can't let what happened yesterday, what happened is going to happen tomorrow, what the fans are chanting. I can't let that, you know, affect my performance. And so to have that place where I can go, where I don't hear them, I don't hear the thoughts going through my head that I usually do. I'm just focused on the competition and having a good time. Um, that's what the ideal situation is after I meditate. That's how I want to feel. And that's, and you know, I'd be the same way. I think it's really important, um, to, uh, calm yourself down. Um, especially when, you know, our minds racing a thousand miles an hour and specifically like when, you know, with sports, when, you know, people are cheering you on and you feel like the pressure quote unquote, if you do, um, you know, meditation can definitely calm meditation is just used like widely. Um, I think it's a great thing. I, I've, I am really bad with meditation and I, everyone, cause I have anxiety and deal with my own mental health stuff. And everyone's like, can you please do meditation? Can you do meditation? And like, I've tried it. I can't get into a good practice. So when I come out to California, you better teach me. Cause I'm really, yeah, it's, it's really difficult. It's hard I'm, to sit down and just, you know, sit with your own thoughts. But, um, I do mine first thing in the mornings. Like the first thing I do the first, cause I know that if I push it off, I'm, it's not going to happen that day. Like if I push it off and push it later, it's, I'm not going to end up doing it. I got to get it done first thing. And it's like, it's honestly just like, I, so many days I get up and I'm saying, I don't want to meditate. Like I don't, but I, you know, I still do it same way. You still train same way. This You still work out five days a week, even if you may not want to, the meditation is a, a very similar, similar thing. It's just, you know, working out the mind instead of the body. So you can end up working out the body better in the end. Yeah. And I think it's also really important, like you said, to do something in the morning, like meditation for me, like I like to work out, um, in the morning. I do find that as the day goes on, yes, I can go and work out like after, after a full day of work and so forth, but it's much harder to a get motivated, but b the chances of you, um, doing it, um, can obviously fall back. Although working out's a little bit different because you want the endorphin rush, but you know, yeah, no, I, I completely get, if I could drive, I would be working out every morning. I can't drive yet. And I don't want to wake my parents up at six 30 to take me to the track. So I work out after school, but I right. do, I do do something in my room, like a smaller workout, but yeah. days that once I can drive in about like six months, seven months, uh, I'll be at the track at six 30. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Just go. You have nine impressive um, records in uh, track and field. You've also played other sports such as football, basketball. Um, And with all of these sports comes, um, quote unquote, different challenges um, and uh, different expectations. And uh, so among the sports that you have played um, or do play, I should say, which sport has has been the one that has really pushed your um, body to the limit. Yeah. When I was, uh, when I was younger, I played just about every sport. I was just sort of like a regular, regular, Mm -hmm. you know, able quote unquote, able-bodied kid, but I I would just play every sport, you know, whatever season was my friends just played 
Um, and basketball was my, my favorite sport up until I watched the Rio 2016 Paralympics. And I fell in love even more with track and field. And I began taking track and field really seriously because I thought I, I really think that I, I thought at the time that I had a chance of competing at the Paralympics, which had always been like a lifelong dream of mine. And I just finally found the thing that motivated me in the sport that I loved enough. So as far as the sport that has pushed my body to the limits, you know, physically, it would a hundred percent be track and field just because the stuff and, and the, the, the training and everything that's involved with it that I'm even doing right now, obviously leading up to the Tokyo Paralympics in 2021 um, is something unlike I've ever experienced. And it's, it's pretty crazy because we're, you know, me and my coach are learning and growing and figuring this out together. Um, and what we're still putting in countless hours of work and making sure everything's on point. And, and it's such an amazing process to be a part of. So I would say that, yeah, track has, uh, basketball is probably close second, I guess, but, uh, but track is the sport that has pushed me to my physical limits the most. And it's also my favorite sport and the only sport I'm doing right now. So, yeah. Awesome. What advice would you give to somebody who, um, uses a prosthetic, um, and wants to, or is, um, pursuing, um, a career or a hobby, um, being an athlete? Yeah, I tell them, go for it. I mean, your disability should not hold you back from doing the things you want to do. In my case, I compete against, in my school track meets, competing against all able-bodied people. And that might be intimidating to someone, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I put my disability behind me in that sense. And, and I just compete as if I was, you know, like any other person, like any other different person on the planet. And so, uh, I mean, of course, I'm, when you're competing in the Paralympic system, I'm competing against people with the same disability as me. Um, but yeah, go for it. I mean, just, life's too short to not try things and have fun and go for it. And if you don't like it, it doesn't work out. You're not having fun with it. Who cares? Like at least you tried, at least you went for it. And so I think I would definitely tell them that just go for it and don't let your disability hold you back hundred percent. That's great advice. Uh, so you and your dad uh, started an organization called uh, Angel City Sports. Uh, can you tell us about the organization and its mission? Yeah, basically my dad took me to my first track meet when I was eight years old and it was halfway across the country. It was in Oklahoma. A tornado had just rolled through there. My mom didn't really want us to go. She was worried about something happening. What you know? And we ended up going and during one of the events, my dad was just like, why are we coming halfway across the country to run, jump, and throw stuff? Why isn't this happening in Los Angeles? Why are we coming to Tornado Alley in tornado season to literally run, jump, and throw stuff? And that's when the idea began. And then it took two years of my dad working his butt off to put on, and you know, with the great team, the first Angel City Games in 2015. Um, and then it's just grown every year. And you know, we moved from one game a year to throughout the year programming and you know, helping thousands of athletes. And then now, you know, we talked earlier about what we were doing um, outside of sport and, you know, all this business, like we're totally like expanding the game and, and really at the end of the day, helping people with physical disabilities achieve dreams and achieve the things they want to achieve. Um, Cause we know the power of sports. I know it, you know it. I mean, even you just talking about the endorphins kick and how amazing it is when you're walking on the incline on the treadmill, like sport is so powerful psychologically, physically, it does so much for you. So to be able to provide sports and then not only sports, but just like a community, a community for these athletes where they can go to and feel like they belong. Because at the end of the day, people with physical disabilities don't really feel like they belong. They're bullied in schools across America. They feel like they're left out. They feel isolated alone. And so to have a place, a sport venue, a competition where they can come compete, have fun and, and not feel like they're the only person there and they're like the outsider or the quote unquote different one. Um, so to have that and have programming like that throughout the year and provide all these opportunities for them, um, I'm just grateful to be a part of such an, such an amazing movement that's going to be taking off and hopefully has have the stands filled in LA in 2028 at the Paralympic games and in, in our hometown where it all started. So. It's amazing. And so what are some of the goals that, um, you guys want to accomplish, uh, in the future, if you have any? Yeah, I think I speak for you know, my dad and I and the whole Angel City organization at the Angel City Games, Angel City Games, we want to have tens of thousands of athletes and become the largest adaptive sports competition in the world. Because you think about the Paralympics, that's only the elite. And that's still thousands of athletes. We want to have the biggest 
Paralympic competition, adaptive sports competition on the planet, uh, have the stands filled, you know, and really open people's eyes about people with physical disabilities and provide communities for these athletes and sports and, you know, friends and create, you know, memories and friendships that's going to last forever, last beyond the sports will, you know what I mean? And so um, to be able to provide that and, and uh, that, yeah, the goal would just be create the largest adaptive sports competition on the planet. That's, that's the goal. Mark my words. We'll look back 10 years from now and we have tens of thousands of athletes and angel cities, a worldwide organization, helping people with physical disabilities, get into sports, you know, on all four, all corners of the planet, we'll look back on this and say, damn, like they really manifested that. So. And I, I really do think that you and your dad are going to go that far. Inclusion and accessibility uh, for people with disabilities, uh, as well as the Americans with Disabilities Act or under the Americans with Disabilities Act too. It's a key issue or um, thing basically in this um, world that we live in um, for people um you know, in order to live as able lives as possible. Uh, what suggestion would you uh, give to uh, the ADA um, or, you know, people, you know, uh, working on accessibility um, and inclusion um, that you think would help people um, who are differently able that is not necessarily already in place or yeah, in existence? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think, I think that's definitely been a lot of progress within just like how buildings becoming more accessible, you know, for wheelchairs. Um, but there's still a lot of, you know, older buildings and stuff that are just not wheelchair accessible. And I broke my femur when I was in sixth grade and I couldn't walk for three months. So I was putting, I was had to be in a wheelchair for three months. And in those three months, I experienced an unbelievable, an unbelievably difficult time getting in and out of little, little steps here and all that sort of stuff. And so I completely, and it was only three months. So I can't even imagine, you know, the struggles that people who are in wheelchairs go through to get around accessibility within buildings, within, you know, parking lots, within, you know, parks, everything. And so I think it's definitely improved from where, you know, we were 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and people are really becoming more aware and buildings are becoming more accessible. But I think there's, there's so much more work to be done within that sense. Um, Cause you know, there's like, there's not a lot of, there's tons of buildings that are super old that aren't completely accessible. And so I think that's uh, that's definitely a big step that, you know, needs to be, I mean, it's already been taken, but it needs to be progressed even further because I was in a wheelchair for three months and there was plenty and plenty of places where I was just like my, like literally to get, to get into my classroom at school, the security guards had to lift me up 10 stairs and then place me on the top. And then I would roll in the class. They would walkie talkie them and they would lift me up in the wheelchair and walk down the steps and put me back down. And that's just a small, small, you know, example of you know, the challenges that people in wheelchairs face on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, with, with all that sort of stuff and, and getting around. So this is a fun question that uh, I want to um, kind of end on. If you were given a one minute um, ad for the Super Bowl, what encouraging message uh, would you give to people uh, with disabilities across the world? Hmm. That's a good one. I would, uh, I would just, you know, I would probably just talk about the message that we talked about earlier that like everyone's different, right? to make them feel not as alone because with people with physical disabilities especially if they are in a community where maybe they're not as accepted and, and they're maybe the only person that they know with the physical disability or an impairment um, can feel super alone and so if i can have this one minute super bowl ad it would be to let them know that they're not alone and there's mm -hmm. you know millions of other people with physical disabilities across america in the same boat as them and talk about talk about angel city and how there's a place where you can come together and compete and meet people and have a community behind you because there's people who do care about you and people who do want you to succeed um that you're not alone and so i think that's what i would say is like you're different that's just how it is there's nothing you can do about the situation just like me so might as well make the most out of it embrace your disability be who you are, do what you want, have fun and, and come see us at Angel City Sports if you want to compete and, and find some great friends in the community. That's what I would say. I can't wait to meet you in person, Ezra. You're amazing.